Okay, guys. Um, so we've been talking about gross income. We're going to finish up chapter five today, and then we'll get to fringe benefits. I don't think we're going to make it to chapter seven, but we'll see. Um, I saw the homework, so I know that chapter seven was a struggle. I expected it to be a bit of one. Um, so we will spend plenty of time going through, particularly the capital gains. I'm not sure we're going to have time to cover the investment income um, section. So. Next week, more than likely, we'll start with Chapter 7, um, but we're going to go right to capital gains. Guys, if you, I know I sent out that document and I said you don't have to read it. I probably should have told you you have to read it. Um, look, it's really there for your benefit. I'm not just trying to give you extra reading. Um, I think a couple of you who have read it said, agreed with me that it is more helpful. And I'm not saying it because I wrote it and I think I'm wonderful or great or anything because I don't. But I just try to make it more user friendly than what's in the book. Um, I try to include more examples. I try to go about it a different way than the book is going about it. And usually people will come back and tell me that they understood it much better after they read that document. So if you haven't read it, I very, very strongly suggest that you spend some time over the weekend looking at it. That way when you come to the class on Tuesday, okay, you have a pretty good handle on it already. And that way, what I'm doing up here on the board is going to make sense and you're not just going to be totally clueless and sort of left out of what's going on. So just imploring you to please have some kind of so you do think it's for your benefit. Um, and if you don't, that's up to you. <laughs> um, okay, so we were talking about gross income. We covered really what is gross income, and now we are going through a bunch of exclusions. Okay, things that the code has said. Yes, these things make you wealthier, but for various reasons, the, uh, the Congress has decided to say, even though you have this money or you have this wealth, we're not going to tax it, okay? And we said that they usually do this for one or two reasons. One reason being um, to encourage you to invest in certain sorts of behaviors, okay? Education, uh, they like education. Uh, homes, they like you to have homes, okay? So they're providing certain exclusions here. Now we're getting more into different types of, um, we're gonna start with some exclusions that really are to help taxpayers because they might be facing a double tax if these exclusions weren't provided. Um, we left off talking about um, educational exclusions. Okay, we talked about scholarships and we said in general scholarships are not going to be taxable um, unless you're asked to perform some sort of services in exchange for the scholarship. Then really it's just hidden compensation. And there was a few further exceptions to that. Um, Okay, there's a couple of other sort of educational exclusions that the book goes through, guys. Um, you guys may be familiar because these are fairly new. Uh, 529 plans, some of you may have them. Your parents might have set them up for you um, and covered all plans. Basically, these are plans that you can put money into, and the earnings on them, okay, they earn interest, they earn dividends. The earnings grow tax-free, okay? Normally, interest, dividends, these are going to be very taxable, okay? But if they're in a 529 plan, and you use that money for a qualified purpose, then the government isn't gonna tax you on that interest and those earnings, okay? I will tell you that Obama has thrown out there that he would like to tax these things. I don't think it'll get anywhere um, because usually Congress is pretty against passing any sort of educational funds, but um, it, it has been proposed to tax these plans, which kind of really would make them, you know, move the point of even having them, honestly. But, that's besides the point. Okay, so 529 covered out plans, guys. You know, the earnings on them are tax free. Um, there are bonds out there, federal bonds called Series EE bonds. I don't think they're super <coughs> popular nowadays. I know when I was little, and I know in my family that they were always big believers in government bonds, particularly these Series EE bonds. Um, and a lot of times people would buy them for you when they had a baby or someone made a communion or, you know, other things of that nature. Um, and the way these bonds work, guys, is usually um, you could maybe buy the bond for $50, but it had a face value of $100, okay? And they might mature usually on something like 20 years, even though there's other shorter terms, maybe 10, whatever. Um, and the way it works really is, is that these bonds don't pay you any interest on a year-to-year -year basis. You just generally keep them until they mature in 20 years, and then you have double the amount of money that the person originally paid for, it, okay? Um, and the rules basically say, look, if you cash these bonds out when they mature, and you use that interest component, okay, the difference between the face value and what the purchase price was, if you use it for a qualifying purpose for you, your spouse, or your dependent, it's not gross income, 
Okay? You could take this interest tax rate. You have to use it for a qualifying educational purpose. Okay? Um, I will throw out that these partic this particular exclusion is subject to what's called a phase out. Um, and you guys will become more familiar with phase out. The phase out basically means the code starts out by saying, oh, if you use, if you have this interest and you spend it on education, well, it's not gross income to you. But then they step in, okay, and say, but if you make a certain amount of money, you know, paired with your filing status, well, some of that interest is gonna start to become taxable. And the more money you make, the more taxable it starts to become, okay? To the point where if you make just too much money altogether, the entire amount of interest is going to be subject to tax. I'm not, for this exam, we're not going to worry about this particular phase out. Just know that these are not, it's not always going to be a clear, uh, free and clear exclusion for gross income. If you make, you know, whatever the IRS determines is a substantial amount of money, then you may in fact be looking at some gross income, even if you're using it for education purposes, okay? Okay. Now we're going to step into look at some exclusions due to the mitigation of double taxes. And what this means is that unless Congress provided these exclusion guides, um, they would really be taxing these funds twice. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is gifts and inheritances. Okay? If you receive a gift or if you receive an inheritance, it is tax-free to the recipient. They do not have to report to gross income. And the reason for this, guys, is simply because, and we've talked about this in the very early days of the class, is that um, these funds really may be subject to gift or estate taxes by the donor, the person paying them over to you, right? We said that if they give gifts of more than $14,000 a year, or if their estate after they passed, plus all of these gifts that they've given are more than $5.4 million, right, they may have to pay transfer taxes. So because this is a possibility and because these gifts and because these inheritances give you, they may be facing this sort of estate gift tax, okay? The code doesn't charge a tax to the recipient of the gift as well because there's a potential that would be, they would be taxing it here at the gift estate tax level and then they would be taxing it again to the recipient as gross income. That's why they're doing this, okay? Because there's a possibility the person paying it may have to pay the transfer tax. Um, just to be clear, guys, gifts are given while the donor is alive, okay? Inheritances are received, usually by bequest, through their will after they've passed, okay? And there's a distinction between a gift um, and inheritance. Now, guys, talking about gifts, because a lot of times we get to sort of hair splitting, uh, a lot of taxpayers will argue that a prize or a reward is a gift. Well, they gave it to me. I don't know them, you know? Um, Look, a gift has to be given with what's called a disinterested generosity, okay? It has to be given with absolutely no strings attached, meaning they don't want anything from you. They are truly doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They want to see you have it, and they expect nothing in return, okay? I will tell you there can almost never be a gift between an employee and an employer. Um, why? Because really it's hidden compensation. What are they, they're rewarding you for a job well done, or they want you to do a good job, so they're gonna throw a little more money or a benefit your way. Um, you know, uh, prizes and awards. A lot of times people will make the argument, well, it's, it's a gift, they gave it to me. Well, probably not, because they're probably not totally, you know, this store who just gave you, you know, a free car or a free jet ski and this contest, what do they want? They want some publicity, right? They want their name stamped on, you know, above the thing. They want their name printed in the brochure or the local newspaper, or they want you to stand there and have your picture taken next to this Jesse with their name printed on. They're looking for publicity. Um, so you really have to look at the intention of which this was given and then decide, well, was it a gift or was it a prize or an award? Prizes and awards are taxable. Gifts are not, okay? So you have to look the reason behind it. Um, Jared, getting back to the baseball the other day, we were talking about, you know, the home run balls and treasure trove and that generally these home run balls. They're probably not gonna tax you on, but there's no sort of clear answer coming from the IRS there. Um, there was a case, uh, it was two years ago, um, a guy in New York, a, a young fella who was in college, caught one of Derek Jeter's, I don't know which ball it was, particularly if one of you guys may know. Um, the which one? No, it was, it was Derek Jeter, I know it was Derek Jeter, I don't know, it was like 2,500 hits, I forget. Um, it was one of his big balls. It was worth a lot of money. Um, and he did the right thing. He was a nice guy, and 
you know, I'm sure security tracked him down immediately. And he gave the ball back because he realized Jeter really wanted this ball that meant something to him. And he gave it back. Um, and the Yankee organization, in turn, gave him like $50,000 worth of seats for the rest of the season. They gave him all sorts of like gear and sign stuff and bats and balls and, you know, all sorts of other things. And it was about, I think, about $50,000 in total. Um, and then, you know, the tax articles start saying, well, is this a gift or is this a surprise or, you know, is this treasure trove? What is this? Um, and here you have to really stop and say to yourself, well, how did this happen? Did he just say, you know what, here's this ball and like walk out of the room and say, I'm done. Here you go, Derek Jeter. You know, you're awesome. Here's your ball. Um, and start to walk away. And then the Yankee organization said, you know what, you're a really good guy. Here's these tickets worth $50,000. Or was it a matter of Derek Jeter would really like to have that ball? No, you know what, I know this ball's worth a lot of money. Sorry, well, here, in change for that ball, we'll give you these tickets, okay? So was it a gift, or was it really, were they compensating him, okay? Because however that trans transaction went down, which I don't know, um, really would determine whether those tickets were a gift, because they just thought he was a super great guy who willingly gave this ball back to Jeter, or was it sort of more or less a trade, okay? In which case, those tickets are gonna be very taxable. Um, so again, that's getting to the point of you really have to look at the intention and how everything sort of went about, okay? Um, now, taking it one little step further here, which isn't in the book. Go ahead. Um, say, say like they exchanged it in, like in the negotiation, the Yankees were like, oh, we'll pay the taxes on this. Would that, would that money technically be taxable because it's in the eyes of the government is more money on top? Well, he would have to recognize income on the ball that he gave up. Right. Um, and then he could, it on the way back out, but you know it's going to be income. It wasn't, it wasn't a gift. Those those tickets weren't a gift to him. He gave the ball away, right? And the IRS has said, if you give the ball back, we're not going to come after you. Okay, you gave the ball back, but he took something else in, in turn. Um, he took something of value, um, and he's not going to be able to argue if it was a gift if he negotiated for it. So he's going to have to come there. Okay, um, so. When, um, if it's a gift versus an inheritance, guys, if it's a gift, you take the don what's called the donor's carryover basis, okay? If it's an inheritance, the basis you take is the fair market value at the date of death. So when you acquire an asset in tax, guys, you have to take some sort of basis on it, okay? This becomes your adjusted basis. And it depends on how you acquire an asset. Typically, if you buy something, you take a cost basis in this asset. Okay, but in the case of gifts and inheritances, you didn't buy something, so there's no cost involved. So if it's a gift, you take the donor's basis before they gave it to you. If it's an inheritance, your basis becomes the fair market value at the date of death. What they're starting right up here is that a little scenario is that you know we have a grandma, she bought some stock way back when, and it cost her five thousand dollars. And 20 years later, her grandma was good at investing, and the stock's now worth a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, if she gives this as a gift then the person receiving the gift, their basis becomes grandma's $5,000 basis, okay? It's a transfer basis, carryover basis. If it's an inheritance, guys, and this is what it was worth when she died, well, that's gonna become their basis. They're gonna get a, it's called a step-up basis. Okay? So if they go on, let's just say two weeks later, because they need cash and sell these things, well, person receiving the gift, not so great, they have to recognize $95,000 in income. Person receiving the inheritance, on the other hand, this is a little backwards, but they won't have to recognize anything, okay? And they don't do this because, you know, they feel bad for you, your relative just died, and so we're just gonna give you this big step up in basis, guys. They really do this because you know, some of these investments may be really, really old and record keeping and, you know, trying to find the original files to justify the original basis becomes really tedious and cumbersome. So they're gonna allow you this sort of step up in basis in this case, okay? And hang on to this because we're gonna revisit this many, many, many times. Um, the only other thing I'll point out here with the gifts and inheritances, guys, so the initial transfer of the gift or the inheritance, again, is not gonna be taxable to you, the recipient, but once you own this piece of property, if it's an income generating piece of property, it's some stocks, it's a rental property, the income um, created by the asset, that is gonna be income to you, okay? 
So if you inherit, in, uh, inherit a rental building and you start collecting rents from a ta uh, the tenants, okay, that is now going to be gross income too. So the, the asset itself is not taxable, but any income it generates is taxable. Okay. Um, the next exclusion, guys, is life insurance. Okay, and this is akin to receiving an inheritance. What happens with life insurance is that um, someone owns a policy and they pass, okay? And the way the rules work is that the proceeds from the policy actually go to that person's estate, okay? And the estate has to count that as part of the estate value when they go and look at the um, estate taxes. And again, if they get to that $5.4 million level, they're probably gonna have to pay gift and transfer taxes on it, okay? And then it's paid to you, the recipient. So again, they're not doing this because the estate may have to pay the tax on it. When you receive it as the beneficiary, they're not gonna tax you because otherwise you could be a, there could be a double tax here. That's the reason for this exclusion. Um, okay, I'm just gonna tell you, there's two general, there's a lot of different types of insurance policies out there, guys, but there's two general types. There are what are called term policies and then there are what are called whole life policies. Term policies, guys, basically are just good for a period of time. We buy them, I have a term life policy, we basically renew it every year. We pay, you know, whatever premium, and at the end of the year we decide, do we want to renew this policy next year? So if I, you know, die during this period of coverage, great, my family will collect the proceeds. But if I let it lapse and don't renew it next year, okay, nothing, you know, I'm done, nobody gets any money, you know, end of story. And with term policies, the way it works is generally, um, as you get older and get nearer to the eventuality of death, the policies start to become very expensive. So if you buy them in your 20s and 30s, they're not that expensive, but as you start to get older, um, they know that the chances of your dying are getting much higher, so the policies become much more pricey. In the case of a whole life policy, you're more or less entering into a contract for a period of time, maybe 20 years, okay? And every year you're paying in your premium, um, and then ideally by the time you finish with the 20 years, you have now have permanent insurance, okay? You're fully invested in this policy um, and it's never gonna be canceled. It's gonna be in place so that whenever you die, your family is gonna collect on it. It's not a year to year renewal. Um, these policies are more expensive, guys, because they're taking into account the fact that they are gonna end up paying you out, okay? Um, but the payments are generally the same every year, unlike the term policy where they start to get more expensive. What um, also is different about a whole life policy, because this policy is now eventually gonna be, become permanent, is that they have what's called a cash surrender value. So if at some point you terminate the policy before it matures or before you pass, you can actually pull this cash surrender value out of it. It's basically equivalent to your premium payments that you've made for all these years, plus interest on these premium payments, okay? So part of this cash surrender value is really a return of capital, what you put into it, plus some interest. Okay, so keep that in mind. Go ahead. For the true life, term the, life policy, whatever money you put in, if you stop. Then you have no investment in it. So if I don't renew my policy next year, my term life policy next year, that's it. It's just a year to year sort of thing. Um, but if I walk away from it, I don't get any money back. I don't get, you know, my family doesn't get any sort of coverage if I pass. Um, okay, so the general rule with life insurance, we said, is that, guys, it is not taxable to the recipient. However, if the policy is not paid in a lump sum, it's paid over some period of time, the laws say, time value of money, they have to pay you for some interest, right? Some portion of the ultimate payment is gonna be interest. So I might have bought myself a $200,000 policy, but maybe the policy reads that instead of getting paid out in a lump sum on my debt to my beneficiaries, it's gonna pay out $240,000 a year over the course of 10 years. Okay, so my beneficiaries are gonna collect $24,000 a year. Ultimately, what they're collecting, guys, is $20,000 of the coverage, the initial coverage, and $4,000 of interest, right? Because my policy is for 200, Ultimately, they're going to collect 240. There's $40,000 of interest there over 10 years. Okay? Each year, they're collecting $4,000 of interest. Only the $20,000 is going to be excluded from gross income. The other $4,000, they're going to have to report. Okay. So be wary. If there's a, you know, it's an extended payment period, more than a year, more. Oh, sorry, more than just like one lump sum. 
some component is interest, and that interest is gross income. Okay. Um, another exception is that sometimes people, particularly if they have a whole life policy, may sell their policy before it matures. Okay. They may say, you know what, I need money. I need money today. Um, and they may turn around and sell the policy. Um, and the rules say that if they sell their policy for value, okay, to the person purchasing it, it's not gonna be free, okay? The proceeds when that person dies are not gonna be free. So let's just say I still have this $200,000 policy, okay? And let's say I decide, you know what, I need some money today. I can get $160,000, okay, for this policy. I'm a little bit older, they know I'm gonna die before long. I'm gonna get 160 grand. So to the person purchasing it, okay, Ultimately, when that policy gets paid out, they're gonna get $200,000 on the face value of the policy. But let's say they gave me $160,000 for the policy when they sold it to them, okay? Again, guys, this is gonna be a return on investment, the return on capital, so they can collect that back tax credit. And maybe when I sold on that policy, I wasn't fully vested in it yet. Maybe I was, you know, 15, 18 years into it. I still had a few premium payments left on it, okay? If they made any premium payments to complete the policy, they can take that back too. Again, it's also return to capital. So here, in this case, guys, they would have to recognize $35,000 of gross income. Anything that's not a return of capital to them, okay? they would have to take into income. And again, this is not me who owned the policy, the person who sold the policy, this is the person who bought it from me, okay? If you sell your policy for value, then when that policy is paid, it's not free and clear to the purchaser, okay? They have to recognize some gross income. Um, okay, getting to the cash surrender value, okay? So this cash surrender value, I told you, is generally roughly equivalent to the amount of money you put in, your premiums, which is your investment, um, plus interest on those premiums over the course of time. Okay, so now I decide that I'm gonna cash out my policy. Rather than sell it to someone, I just say, you know what, I'm just gonna cash it out, I'm gonna pull out the cash surrender value. That's enough, it covers what I need, okay? If the cash surrender value, guys, is bigger than the premiums I paid in, then the difference is gonna be gross income, okay? So if I cash out, I get a cash surrender value payment, okay? You're gonna look and see what were my premiums I paid in over the past 15 years. The difference is gonna be ordinary income. I'm sorry, can we go? I don't understand where the, what the $5,000 is Yeah. So I bought myself a whole life insurance policy, and let's say I was 18 years into it. I had paid premiums up to 18 years, but at the time I said, I really need money. Um, I can sell this for $160,000, even though it's got a $200,000 face value. But I still had two more years of payments to make, okay? When I die, the purchaser is gonna get the $200,000 face value of the policy. Plus he's gonna get back the $160,000 he gave me, Plus, he had to make two more years worth of premium payments in order to make sure the policy was fully vested. Okay. So he's gonna get back his 160 sales price to me, plus any further premiums he paid. Oh, got it, thank you. Okay. Cash surrender value. Guys, it could go the other way with cash surrender value, okay? I could pull out my cash surrender value, but maybe the premiums I paid were bigger. Okay, so maybe my premiums were 75 and the cash surrender value they gave me was only 20, um, 50. In this case, okay, I do not, do not get a deduction, okay? They're not gonna let me claim this as a deduction. This is my investment, right? This is my capital. This is what they're giving me. But they're not gonna let me claim back, okay? It's a little bit different than annuities. When we talked about annuities, we said that if I die before I collected back all of my annuity payments and I didn't get back all of my capital that I put in, right? We said that they let you take it as a deduction on your final tax return. This is not the same case here, okay? They will not allow you to take a deduction for this. So if you invest more in it 
then you actually get back when you pull out the cash surrender value, you eat it. Okay. There's a couple of other minor exceptions, guys. They say that if you're terminally ill and you take a distribution early, or if you're chronically ill and you need the money to support your medical payments, medical treatments, um, they're not going to tax you on it. Okay? They'll let you do that. I just have a question. I heard somewhere that uh, whole life insurance, they pay your dividend somehow. Some policies do. There's a million different insurance policies. More and more, they're using them as investment tools. They let you borrow against them. Um, they let you use them for certain purposes. Are those dividends not tax deferral or you have to pay tax? I would guess you would have to pay taxes on them. I don't see them as tax deferred. I don't, there's a million policies out there, so it would be hard to speak to a particular policy. But I know more and more that they are using them as investment vehicles, and I would think you'd have to pay taxes on them. Yes. Um, if you're collecting that money today, yeah, you're going to have to pay taxes on them. Okay. You guys good? Okay. Um, in the book, there's something called the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about this one. Um, look, guys, the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion, we've talked about the fact that as a citizen or resident of this country, the federal government has the right to collect your world uh, tax, your worldwide incomes. So if you work overseas or you own property overseas and you earn you know, rent from it, we have the right to tax all of that income. Okay, But the fact is, the foreign, foreign government where you work or where you own that property is also going to want to tax that income. So again, you have a taxpayer facing a double tax. Um, the way, one of the ways that the code goes about dealing with eliminating this double tax is with this foreign earned income exclusion. Now guys, pay attention to the name, okay? Foreign earned income exclusion, okay? And what this rule says is that in any given year, a taxpayer can exclude from his gross income up to, I think this year it's $100,800, okay, from earned income, okay? What did we say earned income was? Earned income is from your services, your labor, right? It's not going to be from property, it's not going to be from rentals, it's not going to be from dividends, um, it's going to be from your labor. You can exclude up to $100,800, uh, $100, okay? One zero zero comma eight zero zero. yes. Um, okay, I'm going to point out here, though you don't need to know this right at the moment, is that when we get further into the book, you'll see there's two alternatives a taxpayer can take. One is that instead of taking this $100,800 $100, exclusion from income, a taxpayer can deduct um, foreign income taxes paid to foreign governments on the Schedule A, okay? Or alternatively, they can take as a credit a foreign tax credit for income taxes paid to a foreign government. So there's one of three ways that this tax can actually be, um, this income can be mitigated. Um, this is one of them. I'll bring it up again when we get to the other ones. Um, but there's two other methods. Professor, what happens if somebody holds two citizenships and you want to give out your US citizenship? I don't know. It's just, I don't think the U.S. allows you to have two citizenships. Because, because I read an article about this uh, last year in the New York Times online, and the number one reason why people give us the U.S. citizenship is because of the double taxation. Um, they had to pay taxes yes. for a foreign country, and they have to, they have to pay taxes to the U.S. Well. Yeah, I mean, I would think I, I'm not even sure does the U.S. even allow double citizenship. I didn't think they did. You could be a citizen of Israel. Israel. You the can. People have three citizenships. Um, yeah. I would think in that case you would have to come up with what your primary residence is and you would have to file based on that. I would think there would be some relief there saying I may have citizenship. Um, but really the reason they're in, they feel that they're entitled to the taxes is because as a citizen of the U.S., I mean, you can use the girl who got in trouble in Italy a few years ago. The government's going to come in and intervene on your behalf and, you know, kind of fight for your rights. And that's where they feel that they can sort of. So I, I have to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I don't even think you Double citizenship anymore. But I read it in the North Times last year too. Uh, something about because of taxation, that's why I think they give out their business. I would think you would just have to justify what your primary residence was and go from there. But I would I would have to look into that I'm not sure. But these people live overseas. No, they don't live here. Um and they hold a uh, use citizenship. I don't know. I, I really I, I don't know, I'd have to look at it. Um, I would think they would have just some justification for saying we don't have to live in this country. Um, or maybe it would be dealt with within a tax treaty, I'm not sure. So, um, okay guys, 
the, the last section of the book deals with exclusions for sickness and injury related items, okay? The first one is workers' comp, okay, guys? Workers' comp deals with on-the-job injuries, okay? Um, these are usually state-mandated policies and the costs are usually borne by your employer. Um, and it could be to reimburse you for injury, your medical bills, or lost wages if you can't work. Um, and the rule here is, look, if you collect under a workers' comp policy, you don't pay taxes on it, okay? It's not gross income. However, if you collect unemployment wages, okay, that is gross income, okay? Unemployment is gross income, workers' comp is not. Um, the book makes reference to personal injury awards. Guys, I would tell you in general, the rule is that for any sort of awards or settlements or anything of that nature, um, is that they're taxable, okay? Your starting point is, is that if you receive some sort of court award, some sort of settlement, anything of that nature, you know, uh, payment for damages, it's gonna be taxable. That's your starting point, okay? <coughs> the book goes on to make reference to the fact that if, however, you're being compensated for a physical illness or a physical sickness, it is not going to be gross income, okay? You have a physical illness or you're being compensated for a physical sickness, it's not gross income. So they're giving you back money because you lost time at work, you have a whole bunch of medical bills, you don't have to report that as gross income. If any part of the award is punitive in nature, meaning they're not compensating you, the person who was hurt, but they're punishing the person who hurt you, okay? That part of the award is going to be gross income, okay? Any part of it is meant to punish the wrongdoer. That is gross income to the recipient. Okay. The book makes the distinction that if um, you have some sort of emotional distress as a result of a physical injury or um, physical sickness, okay, it's not going to be gross income. And I will give you the example that let's just say. Um, I got hurt at my job, I have a physical job, and I got hurt, and I developed severe anxiety, and I can't go back to work because I'm so afraid of getting hurt again. You know, that would be some sort of emotional stress related to a physical injury or a physical sickness. And if I collected for that, that emotional sort of stress, okay, I wouldn't have to take that as gross income. But let's just say I have severe anxiety, severe stress, um, because my boss sexually harassed me at work, okay? That's going to be gross income because that's emotional stress, anxiety that I'm getting compensated for that's not di directly related to a physical injury or a physical illness, okay? Um, so in that case, my emotional stress would be taxable. Again, we're kind of getting into split hairs with all the tax. Okay. Um, the book brings up, guys, look, healthcare reimbursements. Um, they talk about that, look, if you pay medical expenses and you're subsequently reimbursed, medical expenses in general, guys, aren't going to be taxable. I will just tell you here, keep in mind our tax benefit rule, okay? Anytime you hear reimbursement refund, guys, go back to the tax, um, tax benefit rule, right? Did I claim a deduction for it in the prior year? If I did, you might have to take it into gross income when you receive a refund this year, but it's going to be dependent on did I claim the standard deduction? Or did I itemize, okay? Anytime you hear refund, reimbursement, be wary of the tax benefit rule to determine whether or not you have gross income. Um, and the last one in chapter five, guys, under the sickness injury is disability, okay? Um, disability is a little different than workers' comp, okay? These are policies that we buy on our own or oftentimes our employers um, offer them to us through our jobs, okay? These are wage replacement policies. These are not intended in any way to compensate you for medical bills. Okay, so they're no way, in no way health insurance, even though they sound that way. Um, okay, um, and these also guys are good for on or off the job injuries. On or off the job injuries. Um, a lot of times you'll hear people are out on like long-term pregnancy leads or long-term disability. This is where you need disability policies kick in. Um, okay. If I purchase this policy on my own, okay, out of my own money, then I'm not gonna get a deduction, okay? If I bought healthcare, I would be able to claim it as a Schedule A deduction. But again, even though it sounds like it's medical-related disability, okay, it's wage replacement. So I do not get a deduction for those premiums I paid. On the flip side, if I collect under the policy, I don't have to report it as gross income. 
So I get no deduction for it, but if I ultimately collect, I don't have to take it as gross income, which is a good news, okay? Um, a lot of times these are offered through our employers. So our employer may provide this to us, and sometimes they pay for it, or sometimes they offer it to us and we take it almost as compensation, okay? Um, so we indirectly pay for it. If they say to us, okay, you're gonna take this as a taxable fringe, okay? It's essentially the same as me buying it myself, okay? They're gonna give me the policy, they're gonna tax it in my tax return, the value of it, what they're giving to me. I'm gonna pay income taxes on it, and then I'm gonna take that money that they gave me and I'm gonna go buy the policy. So I'm not gonna collect. When I collect on the policy, again, no gross income in that case, okay? If, however, it's a policy they provide me free, it's a tax-free, Fringe benefit, okay, and they're buying it for me. Okay, in this case, guys, it's tax free. It's not going to go onto my W 2. I'm not going to have to take it as compensation, but okay, when I collect under the policy, it is going to be gross income. So look to see if you're allowed to have a deduction. If you can't take a deduction, then you're gonna get it tax-free when you collect, okay? If the employer paid for it and it's tax-free, then I'm gonna have to pay gross income on it, okay? That's chapter five, guys. Okay, jumping into chapter 12, fringe benefits. Fringe benefits are, you know, it's something your employer gives you. It's basically all the non-cash compensation that you're going to get. It's everything that's not your salary, <coughs> not your wages. Any sort of benefit you take from your employer. Guys, this could be something as silly as, you know, you use the photocopy machine to make some, you know, uh, photocopies for some personal stuff that you need at home, okay? That, believe it or not, is a fringe benefit because you're using company equipment for your personal benefit. Um, it could be things like they give you a cell phone, and yes, you use it for work, but you probably also use it a lot for personal needs, okay? That is a fringe benefit, that personal use of it. Um, it's going to be things like your medical insurance, your 401k. Um, maybe the company offers gym memberships. Maybe they give you a clothing allowance, okay? These are all fringe benefits. They're all forms of benefit that are non-cash, okay? Everything that's not your salary, not your wages. Um, look. Going back to code section 61, okay, if you guys don't get by now that code section 61 is very powerful, very important, um, right? Section 61 says all income in whatever form is gross income, anything that makes you wealthier. So fringe benefits, the default, guys, is that it's gross income, okay? If you're not sure, it is gross income. Um, but, okay, like some of the exclusions we just covered, um, Congress does provide excludable fringe benefits um, because there are certain types of benefits that they want employers to provide to their employees. So for these reasons, certain of these benefits that we're going to look at are excludable. But unless we cover them, okay guys, they're going to be very taxable. When you say health insurance, that's if the company is paying for you? Yep. So if, but if you pay for it yourself, it's not taxable? Um, it's still not going to be taxable. You can claim a, you'll see when we get to deductions, you can claim a deduction for it in that case. So no, but if they pay the premiums for you, your family, it's not gross income to you. Um, okay. Um, so we're going to look at the exclusions, okay, guys? And these things are then not going to be gross income because there's a specific exclusion within the code that tells us we're not income. Um, okay. Look, if a taxpayer receives a taxable fringe benefit, guys, it's compensation, okay? And really, it should show up on your W-2 as compensation, the value Okay, the value of what the taxpayer receives is compensation, it's gonna be on your W-2, 
and you're going to pay income taxes on it, and you're going to pay FICA taxes on it, just like as if you collected cash. Okay. On the flip side, the employer can deduct the cost, okay, his cost, not the value that he gave you, the cost, what it cost him. And a lot of times when it comes to fringe benefits, there is going to be a difference between what the employee would have to take into income under the value versus his cost, because he's generally going to be buying, but especially if it's a bigger employer, <coughs> he's buying in bulk, okay, so he's getting discounts. So what it's costing him versus what the value to you is, because the way I, the IRS would look at it is, if you went out and bought this on your own without the benefit of your employer using his big discount, what would you pay for it, okay? That's what I have to claim. He can only deduct his costs. So a lot of times there's a mismatch there. Um, okay, and perfect example is the first one, uh, group term life insurance, okay? This is one of the first fringe benefits. And this is a very, very common benefit when you guys go to work, you'll see your companies generally do offer you this, okay? Um, it's a life insurance policy, guys. Don't be fooled by the name. Um, it's just that your employer is buying it for a group, okay? And under the code, the first $50,000 of coverage is free. Not to him, he still has to pay for it, okay? But to you, it's not, meaning there's no gross income to you for that $50,000 of coverage, okay? However, a lot of times your employer will allow you to take coverage above the $50,000. Anything above that first $50,000 of coverage, you are now gonna have to include the value of the premium in your gross income, okay? You're now receiving a benefit outside of the company. Okay. And I will tell you, kind of like annuities, the IRS provides us a table, guys, based on our age, of what the value of the insurance is to each of us above that $50,000 mark. So I think on page 12, 21, in the book, there's a little chart, which I would provide you for the exam, um, that shows you, based on your age, what the value of each dollar of coverage over the $50,000 is based on your age range. So just to give a simple example, okay, um, let's just say we have Tom, a taxpayer, he's 52, okay, that's his age, Tom. And let's just say his company um, offers group term life, okay, and they allow him to take up to $500,000 in coverage, and he opts for $100,000, okay? So he's gonna get $100,000 on a life insurance policy if he has passes. His beneficiaries are really gonna get that, okay? Well, right away, we wanna take off that first $50,000, because he doesn't really care about that, because up to this, it's tax-free to him. So he's not concerned by the first $50,000. What he's concerned by is anything over that. And then the procedural rules, guys, just say divide this down by $1,000 in order to use their table. Okay, and that brings you to 50. Now you go to the table, because now the IRS is going to say, based on your age and based on the level of coverage over that $50,000, here's the value to you for each of these dollars. Okay? In our case, uh, the book, or I should say the IRS says the value is 23 cents for each dollar of coverage over and above. So you multiply that out. They're saying that's 1150. The value of that policy is 1150 per month. This is per month, so be careful. Times 12. So they're estimating that if Tom went out and bought this extra fifty thousand dollars of coverage, you know, <coughs> with the private insurer, it would cost him 138 dollars in premiums. So this is gross income to him. Okay, this is going to show up on his W-2. It should. And he has to include it in his gross income on his 1040. So okay. this is a thousand, is that a fixed number? Or is that it's a fixed number, it's part of the formula. To use their table for the values, you have to boil it down, you have to bring it down. Okay? Guys, don't forget to pull out the first $50,000 of coverage. I've seen it a hundred times. Make sure, right? Because that first fifty thousand dollars, he's not going to get taxed on. Only the excess. So make sure you pull that fifty thousand dollars out. Okay. This is a formula we should be expected to know. Yes, I would expect you to be able to work the formula. I will give you the chart in the book, but I would expect you guys to be able to work through that. If I said, you know, he had a four hundred thousand dollar policy, what's the value to him? What's the gross? I would expect you to be able to work through. Okay. 
Christmas gross income is 130th out of For like. Uh, just for the value of the policy that he's getting, right? This is premium. Is what they're saying here is if you went out and bought this policy, this life insurance policy outside of your employer, like this policy might have cost his company you know, $85. Um, and that's what they would deduct. But they're saying, look, if you went and did this on your own without the benefit of this bulk discount, this group discount, and based on your age, it would cost you $138 in premiums a year. So they want you to include that in income because it's a taxable fringe benefit over that first $50,000. So the 23 cents, that changes depending on the age? Depending on your age range. There's, they give ranges, but it will change based on your age. Class. And I would give you the chart for that. Okay? It's a simple formula, guys. Just don't forget to pull out the $50,000. Divided by a thousand, yes. You have to bring it down. Okay, guys, we just mentioned health insurance, okay? Health insurance is not gross income. Your employer buys health insurance for you, your wife, your kids, your dependents, whomever, okay? Um, maybe he spends $25,000 a year to cover you. It is not gross income. Congress wants us to have health insurance. So they're not gonna make this compensation. He can deduct the cost, and you have no gross income on the other side, even though you're receiving something of value. You have no gross income, okay? Um, the code even goes so far as to say, look, um, maybe your employer isn't providing you with a health insurance plan, so maybe you're paying the doctor out of pocket, okay? And maybe you spend a lot of money. Um, if your employer reimburses you for that money, Again, it's not gross income. It doesn't have to be a formal health insurance plan. Um, he could reimburse you for out-of-pocket costs. I know that we had a family member who had a very sick baby, and um, the insurance for his company actually capped out, and his company kicked in like a lot of money, like hundreds of thousands, to, to pay their medical bills, okay? It wasn't taxable. It's not gross income to him, even though it was probably a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of medical. Um, he didn't have to pay gross income on that, okay? Um, so it doesn't have to be just a formal policy. They, any way they're reimbursing you for medical, it's not gross income to you. Um, okay, meals and lodging. Okay, there's some quirky rules here. Um, certain meals, guys, and lodging that are provided by employers to employees will not be gross income to them. Okay, there's some rules here. For meals, there's only two rules. Okay, it says that the meals have to be on the premises of the employer. Okay, they have to take place on premises. And it has to be for the convenience of the employer. And what this really means, guys, is that they can't have you leave because it'd be a disruption to their business. You know, if you left, business wouldn't be getting done and they're not functioning the way they need to be functioning, okay? Um, you guys, as future accountants, and I'm sure plenty of you will go into public, um, will get very familiar with working late meals, okay? You're there at eight o'clock still. Um, someone's gonna order in dinner, okay? And you're getting a free dinner. Um, these would fall under this category, okay? They can't have you leaving because there's too much to be done. You're basically gonna be eating, you know, while you're working. Um, this would be covered under that. What was the second one you said? It has to be on premises. It has to be on premises. It has to be for the convenience of the employer. Um, but what if it's, um, let's say you're, you're doing all of it for someone and you're on if you're, it's a, That would be an extension of your office. Yes, that would work. Like if you're on site as a client, yeah, that would work. Um, I'll give you this another common example. Some of you may have friends who trade, okay? Traders in New York City. Um, they can't leave their desk pretty much ever. Um, so most of these companies have full catered lunches brought in every day, and they basically like run and get their lunch from the catering table and then run back to their home. Um, that would fall under these, okay? These traders basically don't leave their desk from the time the bell rings till the time the bell closes. Um, that would meet these requirements, okay? They can't be able to be a huge disruption to their business. Um, they may lose deals, they may lose trades. So that would qualify here. Um, lodging has a third, adds a third requirement. So it, it includes the first two requirements. Um, and now we have to throw in that it has to be a condition of employment, okay? You have to be, as part of the requirement for the job, you have to live on premises, okay? Um, I think the book is the perfect example of a building superintendent, okay? Pipe bursts in the middle of the night. Superintendent has to be there to address it. You can't just roll in the next day. Um, hotel managers, okay? They have to
have to be there because people are checking in all hours of the night. Um, you know, they need to be there on premises 24-7, basically. Um, someone brought up one of the last times I taught this, um, guys who live out in like the oil rigs, like out in the middle of the ocean, okay? They kind of can't go anywhere. It's not like they can bring them back and forth every day. So that's gonna fall under this requirement. Um, take the example of like a New York City firefighter, okay? <clears throat> Most of those guys do like three days on, three days off, or four days on, four days off, I forget what it is. Um, and they're basically living in New York City in their firehouse upstairs. Um, and it would be pretty unfair to say to them at the end of the year, oh, by the way, you have a kind of an apartment in New York City, and we're going to divvy up the rent of this building, and here you go. That's your gross income. That's some compensation to you. Because the fact is, is most of these guys have, are married. You know, they got a wife. they got three kids. they got a mortgage somewhere out in the suburbs. So to stick them with the bill for, you know, the rent that they're living in New York would be pretty unfair. Okay, guys? So in this case, it's not going to be gross income to them. Um, there's a couple of things in here. Educational assistance guys and dependent care, I'm gonna skip over them. Um, you guys can read them on your own. They're pretty straightforward, just nothing fancy here. No additional cost services, okay? No additional cost services. This is something that an employer can provide an employee, okay? It's a service he provides in the ordinary course of his business to customers. And basically, the rules are saying, if you meet certain requirements, he could give this to you for free. Um, and the requirements basically say that he can't have substantial costs by providing this to his employees, okay? Um, and he can't have foregone revenue in order to provide the service. So think of things like airlines, hotels, movie theaters, restaurants, okay? Um, if you work for a hotel chain, um, they may have hotels all over the world. Well, if they have empty rooms, you know, down in Florida for the weekend, and you know no one's using them, he can give it to you for free. You can stay there for free. Yeah, maybe there's some maid service involved and they have to clean the sheets and stuff like that, but it's not a substantial cost, okay? It's pretty minimal. So he can do that. The thing is, guys, though, as the employee, I can't book that room you know, two months out because then he'd be blocking off the room and he might be foregoing other paying customers from taking that space. Really, this has to be done kind of on a standby basis. Um, last minute, you know, oh, they've got some rooms available, they're not using them for paying customers, therefore, they can give them to you. Um, that's why you'll hear if you have friends who are stewardesses or pilots, um, a lot of times they can fly for free, but they'll always tell you it's on standby. They can't reserve ahead if they're going to qualify here, okay? Um, movie theaters, okay? You work at a movie theater, you can go see movies for free. Um, one of the caveats, guys, is that you have to work in that line of business, however. So if you have like a conglomerate, and let's just say they have, uh, they own an air, uh, airline, and then they own maybe a cruise ship line, okay? If you're a stewardess, you can take free flights, but you can't take a free cruise, okay? You have to work within the line of business. But, which I find weird, is that they do allow for what are called reciprocal agreements, okay? So you could have two airlines, Delta and United, get together, and if they put together a written agreement, Delta's employees could fly on United for free on a standby basis, and vice versa, okay? Again, they have to work within the line of business, but as long as there was this written agreement in place, that is allowed. You should have, uh, the airlines have alliances. Yes. Like, uh, I don't know, American Airlines and British Airways. Yes, and the person, the employee taking that flight, it's not gross income. They are receiving something of value, but they don't have to take it as gross income. But as long as it's from the same alliance. There has to be a written agreement between the companies. That's what the rules say. There has to be a written agreement. But yeah, that's allowed. What if, um, like my aunt works with me, so she get, gets a ticket for like $60 and she gets to give it to me at the point of standby. Is that then taxable to her since it's not for her use? She, say that again? They, like for Southwest Airlines, they have a thing called buddy taxes. So it's a standby idea, but it, she can get the ticket for like $60 or whatever it is and give it to whoever they get a certain amount they can give out throughout the year. Is that kind of taxable to her since it's not for her benefit? Um, you're offering them, I guess I would need to know more details because like, are they giving it to the employee as a discount or are you paying her the $60? Like, like she, I guess it really depends it, on like who's footing the bill. They give it to the employee as a discount. Right. Um, but someone's ultimately paying $60 right. is what you're saying. Right. Poss 
possibly not since you're paying for it. Like if you were paying the sixty dollars, it really just may be like a fair market value transaction where they're saying, look, the plane's empty anyway, and sixty dollars, you know, they're going to take your sixty dollars. So I don't think so. I think that would just be like a fair market value transaction. They're just getting a deeply discounted ticket. Um, um, qualifying employee discounts, okay, guys, these are an exception to the imputed income rules, which we really didn't cover, okay? The imputed income rules, guys, say if you have two related parties and one party is offering the other party some sort of discount, technically that's gross income to the party receiving the discount, okay? If they're offering you something of value and really they're doing it because you're related, okay? Um, so in that case, it's supposed to be gross income, but there's exceptions, and one of the exceptions falls under this qualifying employee discount, okay? Um, and there's two categories here. There's discounts on goods, and then there's discounts on services. So be careful what you're dealing with. Are you dealing with a good, or are you dealing with a service, because the rules are different, okay? In the case of goods, your employer is allowed to offer you a discount up to their average gross profit percentage, okay? What their average profit is can offer you that much. Anything above that is going to be gross income to you because now you're receiving a taxable fringe after that discount amount, okay? If it's a service, they can offer you 20% 20, 20 off of the normal service price, okay? So I'll use the case of a divorce. Um, maybe you work for an attorney um, and maybe they generally charge $10,000 for a divorce, okay? If you're going for a divorce, um, they could charge you $8,000 that divorce and that would be okay that two thousand dollars benefit you're receiving isn't gross income if they charged you seven thousand dollars you have a thousand dollars in gross income that you're supposed to report again I'm not saying it happens guys but the right way of counting tax accounting says that you have a thousand dollars of income that you need to report okay I'm gonna do for um, goods I'm gonna do the homework problem it was the last problem of last week's homework because I think it was like an 18% success rate <laughs> so We'll do this one out, um, and I think I know why, but yeah, we're going to see here today. Okay, so, you know, it's problem, I think, 51 in Chapter 12, let me read it. shop where he gets an employee discount. At Darby's current shop, Bad Dog Cycles, each employee is allowed to purchase four bicycles a year at a discount. Bad Dog has an average gross profit percentage on bicycles of 25%. During the current year, Darby bought the following four bikes. Um, what amount does he have to include in taxable income from these purchases? And what amount can Bad Dogs claim as a deduction? Okay, so... We have the employee, and he bought one, two, three, four bikes, and the retail price was okay, and their cost. Guys, this may be different than the numbers you worked on because there's algorithms in the system. But if you can work through this, then you can work through the numbers to get in. Okay, and this is what the employee paid for each of the bikes. Okay, and they tell us that the company has a average gross profit percent of 25. Okay, um, so what you would have to say to yourself is they can offer me up to 25% off of the retail price. Okay, so. Um, to do it the long end way, 32 times 25% equals 800, which means they really can give me the bike for 2,400, right? 75%. Um, I only paid 2,240, so they gave me too much of a discount, right? I paid 2,240, so really they gave me. I 
took too much of a discount. I took $160 more than I should have on that flight. Okay, if you keep doing this, same formula.
They can hand you a Metro card and say, here's your Metro card for the month. That's fine, you don't have gross income. Or you could say, oh, I bought my Metro card today. Here's my receipt, can you reimburse me? That works. Look guys, so if they're just handing you $130 a month and they're not asking for receipts, that's not gonna fly, okay? They just handed you cash and they don't know how you're spending it, okay? So if they're not holding you to the accounting of it, it's just, it's gonna be gross income, okay? Because they don't know where you're spending that money. You could tell them it's on transit, but it's not. Um, parking is allowed for $250. Okay? It has to be near the office. I'll tell you a funny story about my brother. It's not that funny. I have a much younger brother. Um, he works in Connecticut. He lives up in Riverdale. Um, so he commutes, and his company offers this $250 for parking. Um, well, parking near his job is no issue. It's a big corporate park, and there's tons of parking spots. So he's like, parking in Riverdale, however, is, you know, it's a pain in the butt, um, and it's expensive. So he's like, well, I'll just use this $250, you know, to pay for my parking. So I'm like, you can't do that. <laughs> like, it has to be near your office. And we argued about it. I'm like, it has to be near your office, not where you live at home. It's not intended. It's intended to get you to work, okay? So really supposed to be near your office. Not that funny, sorry. Um, okay. Moving expenses. Um, look guys, generally moving expenses are personal in nature, um, but the IRS does realize that many of us move for business related reasons. So they allow um, limited deductions for moving expenses, okay? There's certain qualifying moving expenses and we'll study those more after the first exam when we get to deductions. But just know, not all moving expenses are deductible, okay? Um, they can, I've seen it work a bunch of different ways how moving expenses can go about. Most common in my experience is that your company, if they're trying to move someone and their family, it's very expensive um, and it's very tedious. Um, and they'll just generally say, look, here's $50,000, just go move yourself. Like, do what you have to do, hire who you have to hire, you know, whatever, we don't want to know anything about it, here's 50 grand. If they're gonna hand you just a bunch of cash and they don't want to see the receipts again, okay guys, you have gross income. That's $50,000 of gross income. What the employee could do though in that case then is for his qualifying moving expenses, he can take an above the line for AGI deduction. Not for all of the moving expenses more than likely, but for the qualifying ones, he would be entitled to a deduction. But that 50 grand cash they handed him, that's gross income. Um, on the other side of it, the employer can say, we're gonna pay the bills. Just as you're incurring the expenses, bring them to us, we're gonna pay them, okay? In this case, they have to be concerned with, are they qualified moving expenses or are they non-qualified moving expenses, okay? If the company is re uh, reimbursing you for qualifying moving expenses, then the employee has no gross income, okay? Because it's a free, tax-free fridge. If, however, it's a non-qualified moving expense and the employer is gonna pay for it, you have gross income, okay? The value of whatever they paid for it is gross income. Sorry guys, I know we're being tedious here and I can see most of you are falling asleep, but <laughs> this is what it is. Um, okay, again guys, I would just say, beware of these rules again. Anytime, again, you're hearing reimbursement, guys, be wary of that tax benefit rule, right? When are they reimbursing you? What are they reimbursing you for? Did I take a standard deduction? A lot of this goes back to the tax benefit rule again, okay? Um, the last section of the book, guys, just the time, uh, is cafeteria plans and FSAs. Um, look, I mean, cafeteria plans really, guys, are just, a lot of times companies will say, look, we're gonna provide you with up to $10,000 of benefits. And you can pick from these different things. We might offer 401k, Maybe we have dependent care, maybe we have, you know, uh, elder care. They may just offer you a whole host of things, but you know, me being, you know, 23 and single, but I don't really need dependent care, so I'd much rather have the 401k. Whereas someone else may be much more interested in the dependent care. So it's a pick and choose sort of system, um, up to that value, okay? Um, and as long, again, guys, as they're tax-free um, fringes, there's no gross income, okay? Um, FSAs, guys, are really just plans, um, generally for medical expenses, but I believe they exist for elder care as well. What you do is you set aside money in the beginning of the year. You say, I'm going to put $2,000 into this plan. And um, it's tax rate, okay? So they deduct it from your wages, but you don't have to pay taxes on the $2,000. And as the year goes on, you might have medical insurance, but um, any 
of you who are living and working know that you're always paying out of pocket substantially for medical bills. You know, there's co-pays, there's extra fees, there's medical tests, things of that nature. So what you do is then you take that money that you put into the FSA and you use it to offset these other sorts of bills that are still coming out of your pocket. And it's all done on a tax-free basis. The catch with the FSAs is you don't want to put too much money in because it's a use it or lose it system. If you don't use it by a certain date, it goes bye-bye. Um, so you always have to be careful with the FSAs. Um, that's really chapter 12, chapter five, guys. Look, I'm going to